Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Harold Davis is the developer of unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency, the creator of multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. He is a Moab master and is ICE ambassador. Harold is an internationally known photographer and a sought after workshop leader. His website is digitalfieldguide.com. And now let me hand it over to Harold. Hey there, Harold. And Hi there. A flamingo scarf. Yes. Yes. Hi everyone. So, um, there you go. See the flamingos dancing around in the snow of Yosemite in the winter. Uh, I'm going to really quickly uh, roll through the uh, 3D slideshow I showed last time with uh, li lingering on the three images that we're going to work to process um, uh, today. Then we're going to, Phyllis concocted a uh, excerpt of the video section showing the photography of the three things to remind everyone what the photography was like and what the setup was like with just the excerpts from those parts. Then I'm gonna quickly do the high level view of how you, uh, pho uh, how you photograph in terms of exposure and process the images from a slideshow. And then I'm gonna get down to it and actually do the images as a preface there, it's always very hard to process images um, in front of an audience in real time because, well, for perhaps obvious reasons. Uh, and I, I'm also handicapped by the fact that this is not my production machine and resources are a, a little bit less than you might like for handling big Photoshop files. One thing I do so, so that it's not incredibly painful for all of us is I pre-prepare cut down files so that we can uh, see what we're doing. Uh, but so that, that helps a bit, but I have also worked through the examples. So essentially I have kind of a crib sheet, but it may also happen that we may deviate from the from what I planned. And in that case, there's something to be learned from deviations too. But by all means, ask questions and stop me if you don't understand what I'm doing in a given moment or don't understand why. A lot of the Photoshop processes here are actually fairly subtle and there's no right and there's no wrong. This is, a, this is fundamentally a matter of judgment calls. Okay, with that said, I'm gonna share my screen and do the first part of that. Once again, discount code for Creative Garden Photography, Garden 40. Uh, there's quite a bit of material about this kind of processing in this book. So if you enjoy this, it, you should probably get it. And here's another discount code for another book. Okay, well, we decided to put up a really twisted slide here. I think this was Phyllis's choice, right, Phyllis? Uh, yep, that's mine, calling Alice. Recap of the recap, down the rabbit hole. Okay, so, you know, something like this image is, of course, a, a Photoshop composite created via the transformation menu on, uh, on, uh, in, on the edit menu of Photoshop, what we call in one of our books in the Photoshop Darkroom 2, the Compositor's Cafe, because it's like a a la carte menu of, of compositing moves you can make. And you'll see a bit of it during the second demo today. This was my finished, was, is my finished version of the uh, foxtail lilies, one of the, uh, one of the items we photographed in the setup. Um, so hopefully I will show you how to get to the same end moving forward as well as backward. The, the, the first part of the processing in terms of workflow is to get the foxtail on a white background. You'll note that it had a vase in the center. No vase, no more. And so part of what I did was I took out the vase, which is really trivially easy to do. Uh, and 
It, it has a black holding line around it. It is also um, on a background and I believe also slightly texturized and then it's got a, 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 a ragged edge um, filter around it that felt that border is one of my the ones I really like a go-to one for me it's provided by on one software in their effects filter and I'll show you how I used that this is the reflection of the uh, roses in a crystal glass, another one that the, the, that we photographed on a mirror. Uh, I have put it on a background on a scanned piece of paper here. I thought on white it was just a little bit too stark. I like this image, it's pretty cool. And uh, if he, but you know, keep in mind that you want to process something like the vase here pretty differently than the roses. There's a softness to flowers that shouldn't be there in roses. This is the one that has the transformation in it. And uh, so it, part of this image has been composited with itself as the simple way to avoid a lighting problem. And I'll show you how that worked. Last but not least, the um, Snapdragons painterly effect. I'll show you how I generated the painterly effect. One of the aspects here is a, uh, a topaz, a couple of different topaz filters. There is a topaz impression oil paint filter as part of this. Also note that I put it on a background and as part of the background I used multiply blending mode to generate a shadow because you always want to simulate lighting unless you think something is going to be flying in middle in the midair like a flying saucer you need to have a simulation of lighting in it so I've got up from the coming from the upper left oops wrong way yeah up, <laughs> upper left up where the tree is <laughs> coming from up where the tree is in the image you've got a uh, light coming down via screen blending mode and in the uh, I'm backwards you see that's part of my problem here uh, coming from the lower right quadrant you have a sh faint shadow I didn't want to overdo it painted in via blending mode okay so this was the table of contents from last time recap photographing flowers for transparency live action processing not so different this time and I'm just going to roll through the images that I showed last time, all of these 3D on the light box. If there are any specific questions about any of these as I go past, we could take a minute or two and answer them. Phyllis, will you tee up the video? Because after we're through with this thing, that's the next step. Yep, video's ready to go. Great, cool. How cool is that? So here's large light box, verticality, two light boxes, mirror and light box. I got a question after the fact as to why I didn't include mirror images in this presentation. Well, actually there are plenty on my social media streams and blogs and so on. Also, you don't really know looking at these whether they were photographed using a mirror setup or not, because when you do photograph on a mirror, you don't have to necessarily show that. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing, Phyllis, and hopefully my sound will still be on. And let's, uh, let's roll with the video. There we go. So there's our son, Nicholas. He's uh... testing, testing, is this thing on? Yes, it's on and it's working. There's Harold. And we've got a little speaker that Harold's going to put clip onto his uh, pocket there. Hi, everyone. There he is. <laughs> Here I am in our living room. Here he is um, behind me, Nicholas. Take a bow. Come on. Thank you so much. I wasn't the one who was running towards the clip, right? Ah, uh, no, no. He it was it, it was not him. It is to be noted. Um, so let's see. With this camera. You can see the the um, initial setup over here. Let me turn the light boxes on. For warning, it'll look weird. Does it look weird? It looks weird. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start with a two light box setup. How weird does it look? No, that looks fine. There's a vase on there. Hey Harold, any comments or shall I keep going? Uh, not yet. All right. 
All right. So off comes this light box. Bye bye. I'm going to box. turn the dimmer off. I'm going to put it by the side here. And my wonderful son Nicholas is moving the next set of flowers into place. And we'll see how I have to adjust the camera for them. What I'm going to have to do is, I, based on the geometry here, I have to move the flowers a little further away from the light box, and then I have to move the camera both higher and closer. So we're going to give us a second or two while we figure all this out. The specifics of how you locate the camera and the angle are going to be different every single time. So, you know, I can't really give you a, a rule for how to do that. I wish I could. There are no recipes here. Hey, Nikki looks pretty uh, small compared to a very big camera there, doesn't he? He's a little bit like a hobbit, I think. Yeah. Showed in the original presentation, quite a few were done with two light boxes, but as I said, the ones that I'm really most happy with are with this setup, with a mirror laid out below because we get the reflections this way. But if you want to get full reflections, you do need to get a camera up higher and you need to get closer. So right now, I'm not getting the entire flowers reflection below. So let's see what I can do about that. A lot of this, as I say, is fussy geometry. We're bound by the intellectual rule. This is perfect. Intellectual rules of geometry. Once again, there's quite a bit of distance between the top flower and the bottom. I would want to be careful about depth of field, and here we go. Okay, we're moving on to the foxtail lilies. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Note that this one normally would not require a bottom That, that here. it would be like a, a number of images I showed the uh, cherry branch, the cactus that bit me, uh, various things. So what we have here are um, some, some foxtail lilies. And the, I don't care about the vase here. The vase is basically kind of ugly. The point here would be to capture the, um, the, from the stem up of the flower and you have to make sure it's on the light box. Now look, I have put this on the mirror. The mirror is raised up to, to Temerar book height. <laughs> uh, it's imperial units, imperial dragon units. The point is really not the mirror. Forget about the mirror. We have, we have it here and it raises it up. But note that I have the uh, foxtail lilies at the furthest end of the mirror. When I originally tried this in our technical rehearsal, I didn't have a mirror in place, but I did note I had to raise it up to get it framed right on the um, on the on the big vertical light box. So what I used underneath it were two books: the worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, the places that inspired Middle Earth, and the Green Florilegium, of uh, which is quite a cool book in its own right. <laughs> Anyhow, so I used those underneath it. So what you really want to do is you want to have. Bless you. What you want to do is you want to have the, the thing on the stalk, in this case the foxtail lilies, about, oh, three or four feet from the light box vertically, but at the same time you want to raise it up and probably about the width of these two spines. So lens, it, the, I was so using... For this, you also want to have the camera back a distance and probably I'm going to make poor Nicholas move things around again. Okay, so I was using the 28 to 300 millimeter Nikkor, which is not optically the best lens that I have, but it has a huge range of focal lengths. And in this situation where the geometry, as I've said, is so tricky, you definitely want a lens that allows you to be flexible about camera position. Let me, let me go back and share my screen again. Exposing. 
to create a white background, seven to 10 exposures from the proper exposure to completely overexposed, bracket shutter speeds, one EV increments, stop when you get to the proper exposure and reserve an HDR blend. I'm happy to answer questions about this, but also note that it's covered in quite a bit of detail in the videos already up on YouTube, particularly the second photographing flowers for transparency video. So you might want to review that if any of this is um, new to you. The, we want the white part of the histogram, nothing on the black side. Here's an example from four seconds, almost white to a 30th of a second, almost black for the black lighted, backlighted part of the image. The camera's light meter will tell you that 1 30th of a second is the correct or proper exposure. So use this as evidence that truly we are smarter than the computers in our camera. Here's the lightest one, there's the darker one. In what universe is this the right exposure? None that I know of. Okay, let's look at the processing overview. You're gonna, we're gonna end up with these layer stacks of partially painted in darker images starting at the brightest image. Here's the short version. Start with the most overexposed, add the same use the same processing settings on each, whether you go through Adobe Camera Raw, Lightroom, or some other software. Add darker images with layering, layer masks, and the brush tool, and possibly put a um, HDR blend on top to add punch. Okay, let's go to some images. I'm gonna start with the raw files. Let me start, since let me do this in the order we're going to do them at. Okay, this this is the foxtails. We have here a one minute exposure, uh, 116 millimeters. Lens was fully stopped down. Probably that means f29 here. If there's any real curiosity about it, I can uh, dig into the exposure data by uh, making this thing bigger and see what it says. Um, f36. So I have the actual way I did this. If I, if it turns out that what I try to do going forward doesn't work so well, and I have my cheat sheets, and we'll see what we can do. This is 60 seconds. Here's 30 seconds. Here's 15 seconds. Here's eight seconds. At this point, by the way, I'm going to say I really don't need any more. I don't want anything darker than anything that's in here. You also, need, you also need to think about where you're gonna go with the image. I mean, I knew photographing this that I'm not interested in the vase. I want this kind of composition of a botanic on a, on a background. It's framed that way and that's what's interesting about it for me. It's the curve of, uh, of the foxtail lily. And here we are at one second. That's, um, that's fundamentally where the camera thinks it should be exposed, ridiculously enough. Way too dark, you hardly see anything there. That's the problem with backlit photos on a light box, with a lot of the light box sticking through. So you also, by the way, note that in the one second exposure, I don't think you can see it all that well, but some of the imperfections of my light box, some reflections on it come through. All that doesn't really matter too much. Okay. Let's go to the reduced versions of this thing so we don't drive ourselves too nuts. And, and we'll go to the reduced version. Are there any questions about the exposure before I go any further? I'm waiting to see if anything pops up in the chat. Oh, Don asks, what is the metering? Metric, center weight? Yeah, I mean, Good question, Don. So I, I basically, since I don't pay any attention to the meter anyhow, uh, I leave it on center weighted matrix metering, which it's going to vary camera by camera. You know, to be very honest, if you put it on spot metering and measure it in the darker black light, a part of the uh, image, you know, if you measured it in, in here on the black part of the, of the image, obviously, um, 
you would get you would get uh, you would get a uh, more accurate reading, of course. So spot metering is something to consider as an option when you uh, work on one of one of these these kinds of images. So here we go into Photoshop. Phyllis, let me know if there are any more questions because I think this uh, this is a really pretty dense subject matter and people are entitled to understand what the heck I'm doing and why. Absolutely. Okay, so here here we have the uh, bottom the bottom image of um, of the um, of the layer stack to be. Let's note how I knocked it down, first of all. Fundamentally, what I did was I, I, put, I, I took the resolution down from the native 300 to 100. So coming out of the camera, this is a 5500 by 8200 by 300 pixel image, but I saved it as 100. And I also um, took the bit depth down from 16 bits to 8 bits. If you're trying to, that would be on image mode. It, it, so this is a much, much, much smaller image than in, in terms of file size than it would be if you were uh, if if you were working on something that came out of a, your camera and you were trying to keep it as high resolution as possible. The rule of thumb here is keep resolution as high as possible, as long as possible. So you don't drop down resolution unless there's some very, very good reason for it or unless you're doing a webinar. Yeah, so Harold, you made these just for the webinar today, right? Correct. And if I weren't doing it just for the webinar, the one difference, and I don't want this to throw anyone when you go and process your own images, is that this would be a, uh, a raw file, not a PSD like this, so there'd be an additional step. Let me just, let me just go back to the actual, the actual raw file and just show you what I mean you know, with this one. This is a NEF file, it could be a CR2 file, it could be a CRW file. You open it up, it goes into camera raw, and you process it from there, or you process it through Lightroom. So I've already done this step. I have changed absolutely nothing in the settings. I accepted default conversion settings. There's nothing there that should uh, throw one in any which way. Okay, any questions about that so far? I don't see any questions. Lorraine was wondering, would you put your focus point on the stem or a dark area or a light area? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not so often one can say that, but in this case, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because I'm shooting at F36. This is fundamentally a flat subject. I have tremendous depth of field compared to a flat subject. The camera is, is it's not exactly parallel, but it's fairly close to parallel to the subject. Uh, if, as long as I'm somewhere on the right ballpark of hitting the flower, I'll be okay with that. The, um, basically, so there you, there you have it. In situations where, which are not so forgiving of focus, it becomes an aesthetic decision and you either have to use the tools of your camera, the uh, depth of field preview button, the LCD uh, set to live view perhaps, or other things to see what it looks like. And you know, you pays your money and you take your chances with this stuff. There's no, there's no really good rule for where you should focus. And that's one of the issues I actually have with autofocus. I mean, you know, if you're sh shooting a person you know that you should focus on the eyes almost always. So there a camera can figure that out too. But in something like this, nope. Um, you know, I would try probably to pick mid ground, but it really doesn't matter here, which is kind of a relief by the way. Some things, particularly macro photography, focus is so incredibly critical, here it is not. The first thing I am going to do here 
is save this because I don't want to overwrite my file. I'm going to save it. I'm going to start a new folder called WIP for work in progress. Within my work in progress file, I'm going to call this pass, save, and I'm going to go into the layers panel and I'm going to say what the layer is, 8129. While we're at it, we might as well note a quirk in Photoshop, which is that a background layer is not the same as any other layer. So by naming the layer, I'm also changing it from a background layer to a standard layer. The primary difference that I've ever seen is that standard layers will move around the layer stack if you want them to. Um, background layers will not, they stay on the background. So there you go. It's 8129, that was the file name for this thing coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Camera Raw. And uh, it's saved, I'm not gonna overwrite the file and we've got it. Before we go any further here, we've got some work to do. You know what we have to do? We have to paint out the bad parts of the background. I think I promised last time that it, the background doesn't really matter, that it's easy with this kind of work to do so. So let's get, let's get to work here. The first thing to do is to sample the white because this may look like white up here where I have the eyedropper tool, but actually it's not really white. So what I do is I sample it. I want to make sure that I have a fairly big average size so I'm not getting some weird point, pinpoint. And by sampling it, it goes into the foreground color and it's shown in the front of the uh, tools panel. So now, now I select the brush tool and I bump it up to 100%. I sort of have to get a feeling for what size it ought to be here because it's a little different than when I'm working on a high resolution image. See, I just erased the power button from the original, uh, from the original image and I'm gonna go down here. It's amazing how doing this simple little thing already makes the image look so much better. Everybody see that and everybody agree? Anybody who thinks that the image looked better with the white, uh, with the bat, with the ugly stuff around it. Um, here it is with the ugly stuff. Here it is with the brush around it. Raise, uh, you know, tell Raise Phyllis your hand. Right. Raise your hand, right. <laughs> you can't raise your hand, but you can put it in the chat box. Well, Danielle is asking, you're starting with the brightest exposure on the base layer? You bet. Why would you do that, Harold? Listen, my child, and you shall find <laughs> out. <laughs> working your way up from here. <laughs> I'm working my way up. I'm working my way back to you, dear, for the happiness inside. Uh, hey, remember that one? So look, the whole point of this uh, uh, technique is to produce a high key background without spoiling the subject. So you want to be as high key as possible. It also means that on white, you can do what I just did, paint out the obnoxious stuff. You're about to see me in a minute, paint out the vase also, because I don't want the vase in this image. So the opposite technique, where you want an image on black, what you do is you start with the darkest image. For, the, for much the same reason. And if you're interested in learning how to do that, we do have a webinar scheduled to photograph on black. So there we can start with the dark side. Here you start with the bright side. Uh, Danielle, can you possibly also, if this still puzzles you, feel free to shoot me a question offline or online, or also review the uh, second and third of the Photographing for Transparency webinars, because they, they do explain this, I think. The, um, let's see, where, where's my cursor? Here it is. So 
what I want to do, I have decided in the wisdom of my inimitable, inimitable wisdom that I want to um, get rid of the vase here. The So the way, the best way to do that is to paint it out. But to paint out something like that, you have to right size your window so you can really see what you're doing. And you also have to get close enough. So here I am, I'm choosing a brush. And now if I start doing like this, that isn't gonna work. You know why? Because I'll paint out the stalk of the flower too, and that would be stupid. So I have to right size it. And I also want a pretty hard brush. You, uh, for many things, I prefer to use a soft brush in Photoshop, but for this kind of thing, I'm gonna want a brush in the 40s, probably 42% is a good percentage. And 36 pixels wide, I can just go like this. I can go up to the edge of the flower. Um, I am not going to try at the moment to do anything about the part of the white that goes over the stalks. Going to paint out the line here as well. Okay, like this, we'll paint that one out also. And down like that. I think we got it all. So everyone understand what I was doing there. That's really a very important move for this technique. Anyone who is in doubt about this, shout out, please. And we'll go over it again. Let me let me just look through the uh, history palette and Okay, so there you see the vase in place down at the bottom of the image, right down here. By the time I'm done, the vase has gone bye-bye. The only place the vase has not disappeared, has not gone bye-bye, <laughs> is over the stalks of the foxtail lily. We'll, we'll take care of that later. I am gonna go back for a second to our um, going to go back for a second to our uh, snapdragons. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I meant foxtail lilies. Here they are. And I am going to take these and run them through an HDR program, which is something that I usually do at the outset just to see what I get. So this is, this is setting them into Nick HDR FX Pro. All the files, including the ones that are way too dark. Again, these have been knocked down and already converted into uh, PSDs. Nick will give you, like most programs that do this, will give you a, a cross section up here of where, of what the EV differential in the various exposures is basically as intended, it's mostly one EV. So obviously this is uh, too dark. What I tend to use this for is to add a bit more structure into the final image. So I pick structure. Now, if you're gonna structure something like a flower in a light box, you're gonna get some pretty nasty structure uh, back behind it in the light box itself too. And so what I'm gonna do is both boost the exposure all the way up, boost the white all the way up, take the blacks down, Contrast doesn't make much difference and add some more structure to it. Since this is all about structure, take the highlights up, take the shadows down. And there you've got a version of this thing that would normally be pretty ugly, but we'll, we'll, use, we'll use parts of it when we get there. This, this technique is all about using parts. Okay, so I'm going to save this off in my work in progress file as an HDR image. I'll save it as a PSD file rather than a TIFF. Okay. 
and I'll make it go bye-bye. Minimize it in this case. I'm not destroying it. All right, going back to our images, I'm, I'm going to open up 1830 next. 1830 is the 30 second exposure here. Let's, uh, let's make a uh, bridge get a little smaller. So now I am going to copy the 30 second exposure over the 60 second exposure. So I didn't, I didn't get that quite right. Technique here, hold down shift key, click somewhere inside the source image, pull it over the target image, let go of the mouse, let go of the shift key. And having done that, I'm going to shut 1830. I'm going to make sure I write 8130 without any backwardsness here. And we've, we've got like that. I'm going to put a layer mask, a hide all layer mask on top. Okay. Everybody still with me here? Anybody who's not, please say hi and I'll try to straighten it out. So at about 50% opacity, I'm still with a hard brush. And yeah, let's make it about 60% opacity. Still with a hard brush, but I'm taking down the hardness a bit. And oh, that's too big. So everyone see what I'm doing? I'm painting in more detail, which is really a pretty fun thing to do. One piece of cleanup we, we have here is we are going to have to uh, take care of the line from the vase over the stems. It's so kind of put that on our uh, to-do list. Hey, okay. Harold. Lorraine yes, has a question. Did, Hi, Lorraine. Did he invert that to get it black? It was kind of fast. <laughs> I made no inversions. Uh, what I did was I added a hide all layer mask. Let me go back and show it again. Right, the hide all layer mask is black and then you paint on the layer mask with white to reveal the layer underneath. Exactly. So, so we were here. We, I added a hide all layer mask and the hide all layer mask now looks like um, Easy, like that, and I painted on it. Oops, I think I just deleted what I did, Phyllis. I can I can control Z it. Nope. Oh well. Rats. Rats. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to everybody, even us, right? <laughs> Well, I'm going to have to paint it in again. That's not such a big deal. Be sure that you have white as your foreground color when you do this stuff. And be sure that you're painting on the layer mask, not on the layer, by selecting the thumbnail of the mask in the little uh, layers panel, not the... So Phyllis, remind me not to go backwards this time. Okay. Danielle says she finds it interesting that when painted on the mask, the blending mode is normal and the white part of the mask is only adding plant material, but leaving the white alone in the base layer. Yeah, that's how it works in no normal blending mode. That's exactly the idea. Oh, I'm not quite sure, Danielle, what you're saying also. The reason you're not seeing much change in the white is there's relatively, I mean, after all, the background is white this relatively little incremental difference. So here's what the um, layer mask looks like this time. Well, there you go. So I'm painting in, you can see that's basically like the three stalks here. And fundamentally, this whole technique is about doing this incrementally. Sometimes it takes more steps than others. So let's move on to the next one. 
next one would be this one and you can see we're getting darker i'm going to look at my cheat sheet here for a second and see what yep okay it's what i thought <laughs> see you have to, <laughs> okay i'm not gonna try not to confuse anyone let me this time use the other way to get the layer on top i'm have the source layer selected select all edit copy move to the target edit paste okay so that in with that one i don't have to hold do any kind of uh, complicated eye hand coordination it's just menu items or keyboard shortcuts to get rid of confusion and delay i'm going to shut down this one um, would people like to type into the chat box what I do next? I'll give you, I'll give you about uh, 10 seconds to do it and then I'll do it. <laughs> oh, the hide all layer master coming up, Harold. Perfect. Good job, everyone. I knew you could do it. Layer, layer mask, hide all. Oh, and Leslie would like to know, is there a reason for using a harder brush when brushing in on the layer? Uh, sometimes. Depends on the situation. It depends if... on the situation very much. There is a very big difference in impact between a harder brush and a softer brush. Think of a softer brush essentially as feathering in the edges. So if you want a gradual edge, you want to use a soft brush, but there's always blowover with a soft brush. So the more contrast there is between what you're brushing in and what's around it, the harder you want your edge to be unless you actually want blowover. So it's a worthwhile exercise to go out there and try both on the same thing and see what the difference is. And by blowover, Harold, you mean that like the, the softer brush just has this like fuzzy edge that kind of like gets into everything. That's what I mean. Yeah. Exactly what I mean. I, I was thinking comb over, blow over. Blow. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust a brush with blow over. Anyhow, I, I think it is also fair to say that I'm doing this relatively quickly without my favorite music playing on a machine that is not my production machine. And, uh, you know, you kind of I spend a lot of time on doing this stuff normally. It's not, it's not like, it's not like instant art. Although somebody who, who's the painter who does the trees, Phyllis. Oh, I'm, Bob Ross. Yeah. I mean, there is a sort of Bob Ross aspect to this. There's also the, like how wonderful it is that this stuff comes right. At, it's like, it's like magic. It's like it used to be when you would do a print up in a, um, Oh, look what I just did. That's, that's interesting. Do you see it on the left there? It's the edge of the light box. I just painted it in by mistake. So if I want to paint it out, what I do is I go to, I, first of all, I'm going to open up that area so I can see it better. And then I'm going to go to my brush tool and I'm going to put black as my foreground color. Keep in mind that I'm painting on the layer mask, not on the layer. And, and like so. Everybody follow me? Good. I'll take silence as the affirmative. Okay, well, basically we're there with this stage. I'm going to pull up the HDR image that uh, we that we processed and throw that on top of my uh, stack. Where's my cursor? Good question. Okay, it comes from having prepped it. Image mode eight bits fine. It can be whatever bit depth depth you'd like. All right, there we go. We've got HDR on top, and next we put a hide all layer mask on it. Layer 
layer mask, hide all. Really, 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 you're not going to want a whole lot of this dark HDR on top. So I've got a brush here. I'm going to put the flow down to 50%, which gives you a lot better control than at 100%. And I'll try opacity at about 15%. And let's get the stem painted in. That. So you know, where I'm doing it right now specifically doesn't matter as much as the idea because, you know, I'm not making the world's most gifted aesthetic decisions on the fly. What matters is that you have the control to do this wherever and whoever it is. And Harold, if, if you know, it, it seems like too heavy to you, you can take the layer of opacity down, right? Absolutely. For example, let's say that I've painted in a little too much of this HDR layer, though actually it looks about right. I could take the overall opacity of it down to half what it was at 50%. And the same thing is true of this layer. If I think that's too much, I just go to 50% here. Good thing to remember that. It's important. There are two opacity controls. There's the actual brush in the first place, and there's the overall layer opacity in the second place. At this point, it's not a bad idea to sit back and look at what one's done. And while I do that, I'm gonna save, save this off. You know, do, do, so I'm turning off all the layers, but the original one. Add the next one up, add 30 seconds, add 15 seconds, and Bob's your uncle or something. Looking at it, I can see I want a little bit more right there. So let me make sure my layer mask there. That's better. Is okay. And it looks to me like I painted in some of the vase by mistake down here again. So let's take care of that before we go any further. It's the sooner you catch a mistake like this one, the easier it is to undo. It's, where is it? It's not on this layer. Seems to be on this layer, which is a little surprising. Um, okay, so we did paint it out at the bottom. That's fine, but we've got to paint it out and subsequent layers too. So I want a black brush. I want it at 100%. I'd like it back in fairly hard again and fairly small. So, and again, the point of this exercise is not that the vase here is so terrible, but really just to, um, show you that it can be done. And you can pick and choose what you want to cut through and what you don't. Let's see what it looks like here. Is there some of it here too? Easier to do this when you notice it in the first place. I guess I wasn't really paying very much attention to it. Yeah, I think I you're a little busy, Harold, doing a webinar. <laughs> Me? I'm a, is this a webinar? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? What I am beginning to think, Phyllis, is that, you know, we've still got a ways to go on this one example, whether we'll really get to the three of them within, in a couple hours remains to be seen, but I'll do my best. It's the best you can do. Yeah. Because I don't want to rush them. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so what I was about to say is that you most often you're going to have more than three individual layers painted in plus an HDR. On this one, somehow it really just turns out that you want these foxtail lilies to be to be very light. Um, here we go. Again, sixty seconds. Bingo in the. 30 seconds, 15 seconds, an HDR blend with every layer shot, the 
vase is now gone down there except for the lines over the um, over the stem. So what I will do next is I'll flatten the image. I have already saved it as it is to archive it and I do save as and I call it a version. So working on a duplicate layer means you don't have to say you're sorry. Always where possible work on a duplicate layer. What we're gonna do with the next duplicate layer is retouch out the lines on the stem of the vase. Layer, duplicate layer, and then I'm gonna magnify down there to see what I got. Basically the only real problem is this, it's not much of a problem, is this, um, We had, we, give me a second, I'm gonna go back and do this again. I, I need my opacity for the clone stamp at 100%. And I can come in and fix the little things here. I have this one set right now to show me forward what I'm doing. And actually in some ways that's a little annoying, but that's, that's a matter of taste. So over here, let's make it a little bigger again. And it would be nice to sort of get it down so you don't have to, that's too big, so you don't have to worry too much about this junction here. Oh, that's really pretty good. I don't think in the end with an image like this, anyone would ever know that, uh, that a vase had been retouched out here. Okay. So here I save off this image and we're going to layer it down, layer, flatten image, save as, so Harold, in your typical workflow, what you're really doing is you get all the layers and get to a point where you're happy with it. Then you save that as a version like dot a dot b. And then after you save that version, you'll flatten it down using the uh, layer flatten image. And then you start working forwards again. And then each time you have these layered images, you save a copy before you flatten, right? Very well said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that way if you ever need to go backwards or if you wanna change something, you actually have everything you've done. You can work backwards because um, when you're flattening, you lose the layers, they're gone forever. Well, it's one of the few really pixel destructive things you can do in Photoshop. Uh, I'd also note that just as a for example, suppose I wanna come back and figure out how on earth I did something, which I gotta tell you, I've got a Byzantine mind and it's often inscrutable. If I hadn't saved all the layers when I processed this stuff forward, I would never have been able to reconstruct it and make my uh, cheat sheet for, um, what I'm what I'm doing forward here, so so in a way, saving individual layers besides archiving stuff so that you don't so that you can retrieve destroyed pixels and eventually also documents what you're doing so that you could do it again if you want to on a different image, and as Phyllis very concisely and well said, the process is to save a multi-layer document when you get to a point that you don't want to work on that part of the process anymore 
either because there are too many layers for it to be effective considering the resources of your computer or because you've ended that subject basically you know so just now uh retouching out the remains of the vase was one subject so i don't really want to it's not effective to add in other kinds of things to that part of the process that's why i saved off those layers i archived them and i'm moving on right now uh, okay any questions about that please put them in the box and we'll try to deal with them layer duplicate layer and i'm going to put this into multiply blending mode multiply darkens and what i'm going to do is add a hide all layer mask to that layer layer mask hide all and i, I I'd like a soft brush on this. I have white as the foreground color. I'm gonna put my hardness to 8%. Anything below 10% is really pretty soft on a brush. And I'm going to put my opacity at 40%, which may be too much. And right here, I want, a, I want this whole area to be a little darker. And I'd like the stems to be a little darker too maybe not 40 percent worth but just it's always interesting to emphasize to have dark stems and lighter petals okay so we have a little bit of screen multiply blending mode there now let's get a little bit of screen blending mode layer duplicate layer and I'm going to put move it to the top of my layer stack and put it into screen blending mode, which automatically lightens. So layer, layer mask, hide all. And now let me move up the opacity to about 40%, 36 to be precise. And there are a few spots in here where things have got a little bit dark, like the rattlesnake end of this does a little bit look like a rattlesnake. Often you paint with both screen and multiply, which seems a little contradictory. It's what I call the Hegelian theory of post-production, but it does sometimes make sense to go in both directions in post-production. So I am saving this, I've saved it, and I'm going to, I've, I'm gonna archive it, and I'm going to move on to the next step here, which according to my cheat sheet um, is basically we're done with the white version. Um, so let's flatten image, save as C. dot on white. Now, what I decided looking at this, what I decided a long time ago, was that I really wanted to put this on a background rather than have it on white. So I'm going to archive my white version here. And I could, I could proceed either by duplicating this image or by saving as. It really doesn't matter. The two things are equivalent. So I'm going to say save as and and I'm going to put background here so we know what it is. And what background shall we use? Well, let's see. What have we got? I think we might just have something set up for this purpose. So Let's look at two different things here. With the, okay, so what we have are two very different things here. We have um, we have a piece of paper scan 
which is something that Phyllis and I made using a flatbed scanner and a somewhat yellowed piece of paper. And then I further customized it by using a layer mask and a screen blending mode in the center to lighten the center. And it, of course, is horizontal, not vertical. So I can take it and I can go image, image rotation, and flip it 90 degrees counterclockwise. So that's one of the pieces I'm going to use for a background. Another piece is something that came from um, Flypaper Textures Impressionist Painting Pack called Vogler. Um, let me first also turn this sideways and then I'll just go for a second and see if I can remember where I stored uh, the Flypaper Textures stuff before I show you how I put these two together. Let's pull up a new window here. Eh, let's not bother. Backgrounds and textures, textures, flypaper textures. Um, and this was from the Impressionist Painterly Pack. And here's what these look like. I'm not particularly uh, advertising flypaper, although they are a good vendor of these. And this one is Vogel. The licensing terms are typically that once you get these, you can use them for anything you want. You don't have to credit anybody, but you cannot also sell them as textures, basically sell or license, which is fair enough, of course. So um, I did a course for LinkedIn Learning on textures and backgrounds. It is probably everything you ever wanted to know about using the, these techniques. It would be a resource if you, if you are uh, interested. There's a link on our website as to how you can find it on the LinkedIn Learning page. And I think, I think some kind of free trials available if you want to try it out. Anyhow, that's enough. But I digress. Or something. So let's see. We were at Foxtail Lilies. And we were within here somewhere. And for the minute, I'm going to minimize our, uh, our on a background. And according to my cheat sheet, um, what I did was I took the Vogler and I put our scanned paper on top of it. I want to lighten it and somewhat soften the rather harsh textures of, um, okay, come on you. Oh, uh, we have a profile mix mismatch here. Let's see. So when you have a, it, so it's, it's a smart idea to set up, uh, to set your um, color settings so that Photoshop will warn you if you have a profile mismatch. And here's where you would set that. So I'm going to convert Vogler to Profoto, which is what the rest of this thing is. Yeah, Harold, so you always work in Profoto, right? Well, I don't always work in Profoto. Um, just like resolution, color width or gamut is hard to regain once you've lost it. So you want to take it into Photoshop in as wide gamut a color space as possible. The widest gamut can a traditionally available RGB space is pro photo. So um, yes, you want to work in pro photo if you can for as long as you can. But for example, if you're working on an image that's going to be on a website, that actually has to be an sRGB. So at some point you're going to have a version that's done for the web in sRGB. Um, there's a pretty thorough disquisition uh, on 
color spaces gamut and how all that works and how you should work with it in the first LAB color webinar that's up on uh, YouTube. The um, Okay, so next, what I did was I took the paper scan and I put it on top of Vogler and we're going to shut the paper scan for now. I'm not going to save the changes and I put it into screen blending mode and I put it at about 65%. So this is the paper and this is the Vogler. They named all these in this set after minor impressionist painters for some reason. And you know, you can save this if you want, or actually you should um, in as, um, as background. And then once you layer it down, flatten image, you can save it as background A, like that. And let's see, going back to our, Lilies, what I'm gonna do, the first thing I'm gonna do is copy the background over the image on white. Now there is a recipe for putting Im the, an image on white on a background. I'm gonna give you the recipe, a formula, but I don't wanna confuse you. What I'm doing here is I'm pasting the textured file over the image on white even though the image on white is ultimately going to be on top. The reason I'm doing that is I want to right size things. And the easiest way to do that is to copy it over it. So let's go. You'll, this will come, become kind of clearer as I do it. So this is my background. Let's, let's size it up so that it's the same size as the image. So to do that, I go into the famous edit transform menu. I hit scale. If I want, I can hold down the shift key to constrain things so that this happens proportionally. When I'm happy with my sizing, I hit the checkbox to commit to it. I'm gonna go back to this background file and close it so it's not there. And next I'm going to change my background in layer into a normal layer. And I will now move it on top of the background. Now here's the formula part of all this. And as I've said again, once again, I do have an extensive, uh, extensive and very well organized course on backgrounds and textures. Uh, I'm putting it at 15% in the normal blending mode. I'm going layer, duplicate layer, and I'm gonna put the duplicate into multiply blending mode, and I'm gonna put it at 85%. Like that. Make sense to everybody? Formula, normal blending mode, 15%, duplicate and multiply blending mode at 85%, at least 85% of the time, that will get you a very, very nice image on, you know, on white on top of a background. Any questions about this? Okay. So one could truly call this done, except I looked at it and I said, I wanna put this raggedy edges in it, okay? So 
let's uh, let's give that a whirl. First of all, what I've just I'm, what I've discovered with using the on one raggedy edge filter is I need to build up my background around my image. First of all, I'll layer it down. I've archived it, and we're going to save it as a. like that. And I'm going to change my canvas size to build it up around it. I don't want this um, kind of awful green there. I'm going to put a black background. I have the relative box checked. So that means I get to add on relatively. And this is really trial and error usually. I mean, how much height you want and how much room you want to give it is you know, who the heck knows. Um, but we'll try, according to my cheat sheet, six inches height and four inches width. And like that. And then on my automate menu, file, automate, we've got on one effects. Like that. And what we want, and it sometimes takes me a little digging to find it in here, is um, a the we want the borders. Here we are. That wasn't so bad. The borders, and we want um, the antique decal. Oh, well, we really did pretty well here. If I were going to go back and redo this to get it right, which I think I will, we need a little less height. So maybe how much height did we put in? We put in four inches of height. Um, no, we put in six inches of height. Maybe what we should do is just put in um, three and a half of height instead and see how that goes to get it even all around. I'm going to cancel this. Okay, lose my work. It's a terrible thing. Um, so I'm going to do canvas size again. So we're going to do height 3.5 with 4. Okay, and then we're going to go back to on one effects. And this time it should come up with the deckled edge. Um, nope, it didn't. Oh, well. Who knew? Borders. Antique deckled. Oh, it's really pretty cool, isn't it? You can play with the um, parameters here. The fit image one seems to do the most, I guess and the thickness of the thing. You know, if you want it a little thicker or a little thinner, and you can there you go, and you apply it. Hi, Deborah. Uh, yes, on one is another filter pack. It's pretty much the same idea as uh, the Topaz stuff um, or, or Nick or any of them. The fact is that the developers have a choice as to where you, where you run them from. Mostly what the developers would really like to do, and this goes for Topaz and for as well as well as uh, as well as on one, is they'd really like you to run it as an independent third-party product through their own studio, you know, as a standalone. But once you implement it into Photoshop, there are a number of different ways you can implement it. In fact, on one is also here on the filter menu. 
I don't know why I accessed it via automate. Um, it's just one of those things because historically it was only available on automate, but more recent versions are also available on the filter menu as well. I do like their borders, their antique effects and their black and white very much. But then again, if I were paying for it, I'm not sure that I would like it enough. But the file automate business doesn't matter. It's just another way to access a third party product. All right. So what you would do here is you would save this and you would layer it down and you would go save as and you could call this final and you would save this as a master version and keeping in mind that this is a preposterously low version low res version of this you would then save off a version for a web jpeg uh, with the uh, color space set to sRGB and save off a, vision, a version for specific printers. Okay, next let's take a look at the um, one on the mirror. Here we are at a minute. This one is, by the way, at 70 millimeters. It's a less telephoto because I wanted to get the full reflection in 40 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds five seconds, two and a half seconds, and that's it. Okay. The reduce set will start as usual with the uh, lightest version. Let's run it through the HDR program first this time. Note there are only uh, five uh, um, versions in the bracket here. That's probably a, a little under for the, but it is what it is. And create HDR. Okay, once again, you know, that's pretty awful looking. What I really have to do is boost up the exposure all the way, pretty much all the way. Highlights brighter, shadows, uh, shadows brighter, everything brighter, 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 brighter. Here we go. Not bad. And these computers just don't get it, do they, Harold? <laughs> also, uh, the setup I have is not rendering this very well as far as that goes, which is a, another issue. You want to be working on a system that is that is rendering things fairly accurately and perhaps is profiled as well. Okay. Oh, and Lorraine's just wondering, is that in NIC? The, the yes. HDR program. Yes. The HDR program is part of the NIC suite. Right. And Don wonders, is HDR FX Pro your preferred HDR program versus Photoshop, Photomatics, or other HDR apps? Yeah, or Aurora is a, is really a pretty good one these days. I, uh, you know, it's what I it's what I tend to use, but it's habit, not uh, not not really a strong preference one way or another. I think the HDR in Photoshop or Lightroom would work fine, and I think Aurora in particular has some real strong points. I think Photomatix is was the pioneering program in this area, but it's probably seen its day. So it's of all of them, it's um, not what I would get. The ones the HDR facility in Photoshop and in Lightroom has come a long, long way. And if you know you don't want to go out and buy a third party app, I would say more power to you. Okay, so I'm just going to save this off for now. You remember in the uh, in the cheat sheet, this was a save a revert uh, a reserve version. I'm going to make sure I put it in the right place. It's not under Foxtails. It's under Rose's Mirror. I'm going to create a new folder called WIP. Create. 
and I'm going to call it PSD and I'm going to call it HDR. Uh, one other comment on that, which is basically very little of this really goes into the final blend. The, the bulk of this is what really is called hand HDR, meaning that uh, you put together an, a high dynamic range image using pieces, using layers and layer masks per, and the gradient tool and the brush tool and build it up yourself the way you want it rather than using an automated blend. There's some, there are some situations in which that's difficult to do, but for the most part, you get better results that way. I am doing a webinar specifically on that I'm not sure, I don't remember when it is. I think we it's when we get back from our August break. Understand that our August break, by the way, is a virtual break. We're just taking some time off from webinars to refresh and recharge. So we'll be back. I think the, I think the HDR one is the first one we're giving in September. Um, I'll, I'll uh, so, so I'll, in that, that one, I will go into a fair amount of detail about it. Yeah, it's on September 3rd at 10 a.m. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's see. So here we go. We've got the white one. And I'm going to save this off. This is 1828. I'm going to save this off as in my WP folder as pass. So all begins to seem pretty routine after a while. And I'm gonna call this 1828. And now my job is to paint out the uglification. <laughs> oh, sometimes I tickle myself. The word uglification comes from one of, uh, where's my cursor, here it is comes from one of uh, C.S. Lewis's Narnia books where the voyage of the dawn treader which we read aloud to all the kids through all through all of them at some point a few years back uh, before the before the Temerar dragon series and in the voyage of the dawn treader they land on this island run by a wizard and um Everyone, the population, the the somewhat deplorable population of this island, thinks that they've been uglified by the wizard. In fact, they've not. They've been made cute, but they get so upset at their uglification that they uh, they uh, demand to be made invisible, which they are. So I'm putting the opacity at 100 percent, the flow at 100 percent, like that, and I will paint out the lines. Interesting point here is that, well, there are a couple of interesting points as you look, you know, one thing you should do when you pull up the first of these images is say, okay, where are my problem spots going to be? Well, one problem spot you have with this image is that there's a clear differentiation between the um, white roses, which are so much brighter than the green foliage that you 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 know it's it stands to reason that you wouldn't want to process both at the same time look by the way once again how much better this image looks just for getting rid of the stuff that's around the light box What happened to 27? I seem to have missed 27. All right, well, we'll have to um, go back and get 27. Uh, I seem to have missed 27. What happened to 27? That's not fair. All right, well, we'll go get 27.
holding down the Alt key here to open it as a copy. And it's going to take a little bit of while for this to load. And here, here I am going to take down the, the uh, image size to 100. And I'm going to take down the bit depth. Where did 27 go? 27 really doesn't want to be there. There you go. No. Hmm. I think I saw it turn into a tiny window. I think it's behind uh, uh, the one on the left there. Yeah, I think it's under there. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, of course it would turn tiny when I took down the resolution. I also have to put the bit depth down, image mode eight. Okay, now we're ready to rock and roll. Okay. eighteen twenty seven. Next step, layer, layer mask, hide all. See how easy it was to paint out the mirror lines. I mean, you know, that really is just nothing. Of a flow at 50%. Now put my opacity up higher. At this point, you can be kind of pretty rough about how you do this. Okay. So let me pull up 1826, which I think we already have here. At this point, I'm gonna to wanna to start to make my brush a little smaller. And a little more precise. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to take my brush. It's got white as the foreground color. And I'm going to make it like about that. That's good. And here come in those nice white roses. And a little bit of a vase. If you look carefully at the vase, you can see that I went too far right here. So Actually, it turns out, no, it's okay on that layer. Could use a little bit up close. I could use a little more white paint at 100%. You know, let no one tell you, there is this, if it's easy, everyone would do it. This does take a fair amount of patience. Okay, so now I want a black brush foreground at 100%. Here we go. Uh, and then with this one, same thing, black brush, blah, blah. Bye-bye mirror. Okay, uh, we're, we're pretty much getting there, but let's, let's add the next one up. I'd like to have the, the nice crystal vase darker for starters. Oh, I, what am I doing? I am. I've already made these small. Why am I? Um, here we go. Eighteen twenty-five <clears throat> layer. Layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to um, put my flow up back to 50% where I like it for painting and this kind of thing. Opacity in the 40s and like about so. And there we go. The mirror takes a bit of doing. Anything that needs a little bit more. Okay, like so.
I think we're basically okay there. Let's add a little bit. Let's add a little bit of the HDR stuff in though. You know, Harold, it's like magic watching you just go click, 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 and the flowers just sort of come in and appear, and it's amazing. It is, does feel like magic to me, not so much that I'm going click, 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 but that but, the, but way, that it, the yeah. way things appear. I'm, as I started originally to figure out this technique, and I think it was uh, probably uh, maybe 12, 12 to 15 years ago that I first started doing this, it was uh, as a result of that assignment from the New York Graphic Society, really, that I started thinking about how to get this done. And as I realized that the way to go was to paint in from on white, it, it was very satisfying because it's like you're making the invisible appear. I mean, it may be a little uh, time consuming to actually do, but, but it, it has the same satisfaction for me that the chemical darkroom did as a, I guess I've said that before, but it's, well, there's nothing. Think, there's sometimes nothing things else. that are most satisfying take the most time, right? Absolutely. Good cooking. Ha. Ah. Speaking of that, what's for dinner? Good question. <laughs> uh, we, Phyllis and I, have been having fun doing collaborative cooking lately, and we have a we have a vegetable garden we're growing, so that basically we can go and cut salads for dinner that's been fresh and living just a short while ago. So. Here we go. This is pretty good. I can archive it and um, the next thing I'm going to do is the, the usual here. I'm going to flatten it. I'm going to save it. And what I'd like to do is um, layer, duplicate layer. Um, and what I'd like to do is make a few areas of this lighter and a few areas have a little more resolution. So for the lighter, I use screen blending mode. I put a layer mask in place and I go hide all and just paint in a little bit of lightness like there to brighten this up that leaves a little dark like here. This is just very much a spot kind of thing. It's a little bit like dodging and burning was in the chemical dark room. Um, I see a question about a focus stacking. Um, and well, it's also about your cut glass on the light box. Yeah. Uh, 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 I guess the clarification, Linda, would be which images are you talking about? If it's this image with the with a cut crystal vase, no, this wasn't fa uh, focused act, and you can of course see the actual photography in last week's video. Um, the with with the um, with with the glass on the light box for those kind of wild images I've done. It's going to depend apart from anything else on the lens I used. A lot of them were with this very special purpose macro probe lens and that one uh, that one has an f45 setting. Um, and then I also use my uh, uh, tilt shift macro which has a f45 with an effective aperture of f64. That said some of them are also focus stacked. It, it's going to just depend is, is really the example. So I'm going to make another copy of my background layer, layer, duplicate layer. I'm going to pull it up to the top and I'm going to put this one in soft light blending mode, which soft light blending mode is going to serve to increase contrast and effective resolution here. I'll put a layer mask on it, hide all. And what we're going to do is paint in particularly the vase and also 
paint in the centers of some of these nice roses up here. Okay. So next, the next thing is, as I said, um, um, got something interesting here. Okay, so take a close look. Where's my cursor? Here it is. Okay, first of all, let me uh, let me archive this. And I see uh, Deborah. When do you change to PSD? Soon as you can. Well, look, it, it's like this. It used to be that there were some PSD is the native um, Adobe format, and Adobe owns PSD. So there's some cross-platform reasons for using TIFFs. Uh, for example, the uh, AI Gigapixel, the rather wonderful interpolation program I use from Topaz that I use to blow up low-res images, by blow up we mean enlarge, is, uh, will, will not take PSDs, it will only work on JPEGs or TIFFs. Uh, so and there are quite a few cross-platform reasons for saving things as TIFFs. As a functional matter, um, PSDs and TIFFs are basically the same thing these days. They, they have the same capabilities. Originally, TIFFs couldn't do layers, and PSD could. The idea would be to standardize on something, and it really doesn't matter that much what you standardize on. I've standardized on PSDs within Photoshop, unless there's some good reason otherwise, so I changed to PSD as soon as I can. Okay, so I am going to layer it down. Layer down, flat image, save as, B. Save. Now look, there is something going on here with the light box. Can everyone see that? I hope so. It's, it's kind of nasty. Um, there's almost a blue streaked light across the roses. Um, Looks like the reflection in the mirror that was there, maybe there was a little hazing on the mirror or something. It's, yes, exactly. I think there was a hazing being a nice word for it, but I think there was like a greasy film on there that wasn't wiped off and the blue color of the light uh, was reflected onto it and it came up through that way. So how am I going to get rid of that? Well, it's possible, you know, if I put it on a background, which I intend to do here, uh, nobody would ever see it anyhow. But let's uh, suppose you want the image on white or, or why take chances about nobody seeing something. It's a little bit like, uh, this is a little bit like the wear clean underwear in case you get hit by an ambulance or something. Image, duplicate, okay. So look, image, in duplicating an image is different than duplicating a layer. I just duplicated this image. The reason I did that is that I'm going to crop the image and just use the part of it up here that is okay because it wasn't reflected. And if I want to use the part of the greenery here to cover up the nasty blue light below, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to rotate the image vertically. So I, by flipping my canvas vertically. So the next thing that I need to do is to drag it over the other image, the original image and try to position it so that so that it will cover correctly what we want to have covered here. So I put my layer opacity of this thing down to about 50% so I can see what I'm doing. So I have a new layer on top of an old layer and I want to magnify it enough so that it can actually see it. So uh, you can see as I bring this around, now it's not exactly the same, but actually it'll do just fine. 
So I put it about here, put it up to 100%. I put a layer mask in place, layer mask hide all. And I'm going to paint this in at 100%. Now, okay, so one part there got overdone right here. Let's see, let's turn it back to white and make it smaller. Got to have a little more control there. Control usually happens when you make the size of the brush smaller. There we go. I don't think ever anyone would ever notice that that has been done, basically. Okay, everybody with me on this technique? We'll close this down. We, uh, we'll, we could label this in case we ever want to figure out what it is, flipped vertically. We'll save it. We'll layer it down, we'll flatten the image, and we'll go save as, and we have version C here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna selectively add a couple of feature effect, uh, filter effects. So I'm gonna duplicate my image like that. I'm going to duplicate the layer of the copy, layer duplicate layer. And would someone like to ask me why I duplicated it? Harold, why did you just duplicate that? Yeah, because Topaz has a bug in Topaz Studio, whereas if you don't do that, you get weird results. They, it wants to work on a layer copy rather than the background layer. Go figure. I'm opening Topaz Studio Simplify. No, I don't want to do updates. Uh, okay. Oh, and Harold, while we're waiting, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, Linda asks, could you do some of your final layers as a flattened stamp and make it a smart object so that you could change it later if you wanted to and still keep your nice layer system in Photoshop PSDs? You know, Linda, this is, this is, which Linda is this, by the way? Linda Rutherford. Uh, Linda, um, I think it's above my pay grade. Uh, maybe you can try it and report back to me. Sounds good. Yeah. Hey. So I am selecting the wood carving uh, filter within uh, Simplify, and I'm gonna use this. You know what? I just did it on the wrong bloody thing though. Well, that happens. Happens to everybody. Yep. So we're gonna go into Filter, Studio, Simplify. What I've basically found to be fairer in an answer to Linda, I, I would like to see what you come up with, but what I've basically found is that there's something to be said for simplicity. And when you get, it just gets too much in terms of both uh, system resources and keeping track of things in any kind of scheme that isn't really a for, forward archiving and moving on as I've done. But I would really be, appreciate feedback when you, when you get there if you have an alternative workflow. I mean, the truism is that everybody's workflow in post-production is unique and there's no, no reason that you should try to adopt mine lock, stock and barrel.
that you should try to find a workflow that meets certain characteristics that as much as possible you can get back to points where you were that you not destroy pixels without archiving them and that you have documentation self-documentation of what you've done but beyond that there are many possible ways to go about things okay so here we have the woodcut filter and I'm going to use that to increase resolution in a couple of areas here. So I'm going to call it WC for woodcut. I'm going to blow this up a bit. I'm going to minimize this so that it's not staring in our face. Let me go back to this one, make it a little bit smaller. And I'm going to put a layer mask over it. Layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to paint this in fairly lightly. You know, you don't want to overdo this particular filter. And maybe add about like that. Just, just to see what that's like. So you can see there's quite a bit of resolution gain when you do that apparent resolution gain, contrast and differentiation. And I'm gonna do it a little bit in the center of the roses too. See that? Just like that, just a little bit. And then I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna back out and I'm gonna run uh, the simplify filter again. This time I'm going to pick a soft filter, not a hard filter. And I guess I really should say that, um, now let's try the other one here. Let's try this one. This is Buzz Sim 2. Buzz Sim, I'm not quite sure what the buzzwords are for, but it's a basically a filter that creates a painterly effect. Um, so there we are in Buzz Sim 2. I'll blow it up a little bigger so you can see it better. It's it it you know it, it I on the other one I amped resolution. On this one I I'm taking it down basically, but I like what it does to the leaves. It produ it provides sort of a golden watercolory hue for the thing. Um, the, the, you know, how many filters are there? Well, you know, Nick Color Effects alone has about 40. Topaz probably has 500 presets. You can go on and on and on. Photoshop has them. I'm leaving aside issues of blending modes, LAB color, backgrounds, textures. I mean, to some, to some extent, you need to know where you're going and you need to have some idea of what the possible is. But I'd also say, you know, play with this, have fun. By no means are the filters that I show the only ones I use or, or uh, the only ones that are out there, obviously. So this is BZ2. And I'm gonna shut this down at this point. And I'm gonna put a layer mask on. Fancy that, a hide all layer mask. I'm going to paint in a little bit of this watercolor and let me do it really nicely on the leaves are nice a little bit on the vase too a lot 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 on the leaves let's make it a little bigger yeah that's nice very 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 nice so just to show you what this layer mask looks like that's more or less where i painted it in leaves little teeny bit on the vase but mostly the leaves so we're going to save this off Harold, we, could you just zoom in a bit and click the, the layer on and off, if you don't mind, on the leaves? Oh, look at that. Cool. Yeah, let's just, um, let's just do that on, for both layers, on, on the vase and on the leaves. So I'm putting on the uh, woodcut and I'm putting on the um, buzz sim there. 
and here's the flowers and leaves here. Put on the watercolor, put on the woodcut, and put on the buzz in. I'm not saying that these choices are the only choices or even the best choices, but they're part of what you should know about as the palette of possibilities. And the many palette of possibilities. Thanks, Harold. Yeah, well, thank you. All right, so this would be the version on white that I'd go with pretty much. And then I could put it on our piece of paper, image duplicate. And where's our paper? Let's go find it. And once again, I'm gonna take my paper and bring it over here. Um, and for some reason, my screen draw here is showing weird notches out of it, but I'm not gonna to worry too much about that. I am going to image transform on the edit menu, image transform scale and pull it up and it would be nice to have the white stuff here about over where the um, go away go away go away i can't get up my checkbox now okay there you go so i turn my background layer into a normal layer i move it on top of the paper layer i put it in the normal blending mode at 15% and I go layer, duplicate layer, and I put it to 85%. So Harold, what and you just did there was you had the uh, layer and you put that to 15%, the one that's right on top of the background. Right. And then you copied that layer, the, the flowers again, mm -hmm. and had it above, and then you pulled the layer opacity up to say, what, 85%? 85% and put it into multiply blending mode, the upper layer. Oh, so the multiply helps it blend with the lower layers. And the the fifteen right. the layer that's at 15% kind of just sort of blends it into the paper, or what's that doing? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to say, Phyllis. Uh, I, I uh, think it actually gives it more presence on the paper, personally. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, this is, again, trial and error, a formula I've developed over the years for this, and it really works for almost every image. It, it just, you know, if you, if you just, let's, let, let's experiment. Instead of putting, instead of doing my two layers here, let's use one layer, normal blending mode, 100%. Uh, that doesn't work. So you put it down a little and you got the flowers on the thing. That doesn't really work. So if you, if you, you could put it into multiply blending mode and it just looks a little artificial that way. So this is a way to put it naturally. You said blending and that's kind of about right. And the normal part of it is a base that sits there and makes sure it goes over the top. And then the multiply is a formula for combining the pixels. So you've got a, you've got a kind of integrated uh, process of doing this. So, yeah, well, th thank you very much to everyone. As Phyllis was saying about the webinars, you know, I, we've been urged to put a paywall around our content and, you know, who knows? I, uh, predicting the future these days is not an easy thing, as Yogi Berra likes to say. It's hard, like to say, it's hard to predict things, particularly about the future, particularly during a pandemic. But uh, uh, no one expects a pandemic, <laughs> right? Or the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> right. But but <laughs> thank you, Monty all, Python. <laughs> at, le at least for the time being, it is our intention to make as much of the recorded content free as we as as we can we don't we we want to take walls down between people not not bring them up because we want everyone to be there for each other as much as we can please feel very free to 
write me or, uh, or, you know, with any urgent questions, any new Photoshop techniques, particularly welcome to, uh, to Linda Rutherford. And uh, thank you very much. Bye. Mm -hmm. enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.